This is section two of the Vietnam War notes. Um, today we're going to look at uh, the United States and what we call Americanizing the war in Vietnam. So we left off, if you don't remember, with the Gulf of Tonkin um, incident, and that led to the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and uh, one of the first things I said President Johnson was going to do by kind of taking more uh, of an act role in this war was authorize some bombing. So in February 1965, he altered our role in uh, the Vietnam War in response to the Viet Cong attack that killed Americans at Pleiku. Johnson ordered the start of something called Operation Rolling Thunder, which is our first sustained bombing campaign against the North Vietnamese. It was um, President Johnson's hope that this new strategy of really heavy bombing would convince the North Vietnamese to stop sending supplies to the Viet Cong, uh, which is this group of uh, guerrilla fighters uh, in the South uh, causing havoc and, and really um, that's kind of been the, the main, you know, fighting force that the, the U.S. and before us, the French, uh, or not the French, but the, the United States and the Arvin, or the Army of the Republic of Vietnam in the South, uh, had been fighting against him. It's the main uh, enemy, I guess you could say, for most of the war, the Viet Cong. But they're not you know, able to fight in the South without the support of North Vietnam. So we're going to kind of look at how they're getting uh, supplies to them um, in the southern half of, of that country. While the bombs caused substantial damage, it did not convince the North Vietnamese to make peace as the communist forces continued to fight the United States, committed more and more troops and more and more resources to battle them on the ground. American forces moved beyond their advisor role. Um, so we talked about that a little bit in Section 1. How President Kennedy uh, had been sending a lot of military um, quote-unquote advisors to Vietnam. They, they were fighting. They were. Um, but the, you know, the number of troops that Kennedy had over there uh, changed completely. Um, as we get further into the 60s and as President Johnson and then President Nixon um, take over. American military, political, and civilian leaders hope the combination of American airstrikes and troops on the ground would end the conflict sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Johnson's change in strategy in 65 stemmed directly from the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, we mentioned him in Section 1, and then the General um, William Westmoreland, the American commander in South Vietnam. They both believed the United States would need to increase its military presence, so more Americans on the ground, um, and do more of the fighting on the ground in order to win the war. Operation Rolling Thunder and an increased amount of troop commitments would fulfill the need to, quote, Americanize the war. In March of 65, the states uh, hammered the North Vietnamese Vietnamese and Viet Cong strongholds in South Vietnam between 65 and 73, so, you know, through the end of the war now, the U.S. pilots dropped more than 6 million tons of bombs on the enemy, almost three times the tonnage dropped by all, all combatants, so not just Americans during World War II, but every, every person in an airplane from every side of the war in World War II. We dropped just the United States three times more than that in Vietnam. And it still didn't work. <laughs> um, Americans also dropped napalm, uh, which is, uh, I'll show you some videos about uh, a bunch of stuff in Vietnam, but I'll make sure to show you uh, them preparing it, what that looks like. Um, it's jelly gasoline, and they drop it in these big silver canisters, and when they drop them, they kind of turn end over end. And it, um, when it lands on impact, it, it explodes and it uh, just causes everything around it to catch on fire. And then Agent Orange uh, is an herbicide that's meant to kill plant life. Both of those things were meant to make it much easier to find the Viet Cong because it's stripping the jungle 
of its leaves and the foliage. Um, it would disrupt their food supplies, the hope as well. Um, but Agent Orange uh, is later discovered to be um, an incredibly dangerous uh, thing to be spraying. It's believed to cause cancer and a lot of other health issues. There's still some lasting effects um, from that in Vietnam. As U.S. airstrikes intensified, U.S. troop numbers increased as well, and this is also the first time that helicopters are used extensively in combat. Most of the helicopters that you're going to see uh, in Vietnam are Hueys. Large-scale battles against the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong uh, were not common, and it was definitely not part of the strategy of, of Viet Vietnamese. Uh, early on, Americans typically, could, typically fought lightly armed guerrilla forces in small, quick engagements. Ho Chi Minh's military hinged on only fighting when victory seemed assured, which meant never fighting on his opponent's terms. Um, and then I think this this uh, example, this analogy, is, is a good um, a good description for what Ho Chi Minh wanted to do. He saw the American army as an elephant and his forces as a tiger. The elephant will crush the tiger if it stands still, but if the tiger is constantly moving, it only jumps out, occasionally bites the elephant, the elephant slowly is going to bleed to death. So they traveled light, uh, usually just had a rifle and enough food to survive for a few days. They dug tunnels to hide in during the day, a lot of fighting done at night, a lot of ambushes at night, um, a lot of... Um, you know, setting traps uh, and setting off explosives and sometimes even using civilians to disrupt Americans, kill Americans, injure Americans, anything they could do. That continued for the entirety of the war, no matter how much it seemed like we were winning. Um, things like that never stopped. The goal of the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong was not necessarily to gain ground or to win major battles. It was just to stay alive and wear the Americans out, both the soldiers in Vietnam and uh, the civilians at home, politicians at home, just being tired of us being there. Um, it was just stay along and avoid, uh, or stay alive, avoid losing the war. Eventually the Americans will, will give up. Excuse the dog. Um, wants to play. Alright, this slide is just a couple different things. Um, I've got a chart in the bottom right that uh, kind of goes through the 60s in Vietnam. So we got through the first uh, three or four of those in section one. Um, in 1965 we've got more than 180,000 U.S. troops between 66 and 67. The American, uh, the number of American soldiers in South Vietnam raises or goes up to nearly half a million and then in 68 it will go over uh half a million so 68 i think i've mentioned this before we're going to spend um a whole day on that really because uh, just so many things happen in just that one year here's a map another map of vietnam the one thing i want to point out in this slide and, I'll, and i have it again on the next slide as well um is the ho chi minh trail so the red line here, you can see it starts in North Vietnam, and then it runs through Laos mostly and Cambodia mostly. But there are parts where it jumps into South Vietnam. Sometimes that's underground. Sometimes it's just heavily forested areas. Sometimes, um, you know, it's kind of in broad daylight, and it is what it is. Um, and that's not all the areas where uh, the trail moved into the south either, but I'm showing you this to show you that most of the way that South Vietnam was getting, was getting its supplies um, was the, on this trail, and most of the trail is in neutral territory. So it's not like the Americans can go right to where they know the trail is and stop people on it, blow it up, whatever, because it's in Cambodia. It's in Laos. Those are not countries we're at war with. We're not going to invade another country um, 
to, you know what I mean? So it made it much more difficult. That's something that we'll come back to in another section because it, as the word wears on, uh, complications or those arise and frustrations and um, going into those countries becomes more of an option in the eyes of some. The American strategy during this stage of the war yielded very limited results. U.S. bombers did disrupt the North Vietnamese. I told you how many tons of bombs they dropped. And, uh, and they did slow the movement of supplies to the Viet Cong, but it did not result in the communist um, surrendering. Oh, uh, and it made the rising number of American troops in the field and the number of injuries and deaths. It seemed like there was nothing to show for it. It just seemed like, well... <laughs> What are we doing this for? If we're winning, why are we dying? Kind of a kind of a deal, uh, and that would only get worse and worse as the year wears on. By the end of '65, there were 184,300 U.S. troops. By '68, there were more than half a million. The number of dead went up from 30,000 to 50,000 or 58,000, excuse me, before the war was over. Each year, the war cost Americans more money as well. Um, so that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. The U.S. mission was to help the South Vietnamese build a non-communist country, but the corruption in the political atmosphere plagued this plan, and they didn't really have any support in major cities. And it made them wonder, and this will be something that we'll talk about more before the war's over as well, if the South Vietnamese don't want us here, why are we here? Because um, there, there definitely was some evidence to show that the South Vietnamese did not want the Americans there. Unlike World War II, Vietnam did not emphasize taking territory. So World War II, even though it was overseas, even though it's before, you know, um, a lot of access to uh, video, this is before Americans really had televisions, um, this uh, Vietnam is known as the, the living room war. It was the first war where you turned on your television every night to watch the news, and there was a death count from the war that day. Um, and its reporters were in battlefields with Americans. So Americans got a real sense of what the war was like, um, to an extent, every single day. Um, and that wasn't the case in World War II. However, World War II, there was a clear line that we had to, a clear map that Americans could look at and be like, okay, we're, we're in Africa, okay, we're in Italy now, oh, look, we're in France, and all we have to do is do this and this, and we'll be in Germany, if we get to Germany, we win, okay, if we get, you know, to Japan, as we move closer in the Pacific, uh, to the main island of Japan, we win, that was not the case in Vietnam, um, the United States, <laughs> It was it was kind of hard to follow how we were winning in Vietnam. It kind of became about body count. Um, is is kind of you know bad as that sounds. That is what it was. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese sort of avoided big engagements. Only kind of attacked on their own terms, and that meant the United States had no choice but to search and destroy to go find the enemy. Um, you know, on various rice paddies mountains, jungles, hills, uh, and, and destroy them when they were there, and go back to base, and, and do it again the next day. We'll talk more about that. Despite the trials of war, American soldiers adapted to adverse conditions. Uh, these soldiers fought with the same intensity that we had seen from troops in World War I and World War II. Um, well, later, some of the same soldiers were questioned American involvement, they still fought bravely, um, because in the beginning, uh, the soldiers we have in Vietnam are enlisted, um, they, they signed up, it's just something, um, you know, they probably didn't want to go to war, I don't think anyone really wants to, um, you know, but they did volunteer for the military. Later on, you'll see a draft, um, and that will lead to more of the number of men in the field, um, not necessarily choosing it. Uh, but it kind of being chosen for them, and that affects the morale a little bit in the war. The early soldiers, or I just said that, excuse me. Many South Vietnamese were different, I kind of mentioned this already, if not openly hostile uh, to the Americans that were there. It seemed like, again, if we were dying to defend a nation, 
whose people were unwilling to die to defend themselves. And some of that kind of comes back to the fact that the elections we were supposed to have um, never happened. And it wasn't necessarily our fault that they didn't happen. And we didn't really understand communism yet. Uh, we Anyway, we didn't understand it yet. We will a little later. Or... When Johnson had begun to send troops to war, many Americans expected it to be quick. We are overwhelmingly winning this game when it comes to firepower and, and military strength. But over the next few years, the Johnson administration kept asserting they're close to victory, but they kept sending more troops, and we kept losing soldiers, and it didn't really seem like it was ever going to end. Um, Johnson's Great Society plans called for improving and funding multiple facets of the United States, such as the economy, healthcare, education, but the war in Vietnam took up a large amount of funding. Uh, obviously, wars are very expensive, and the combination of rising prices, increased government spending, and inflation forced Johnson to raise taxes and cut back on the Great Society reform initiatives um, in order to pay for the war in Vietnam. Before the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, Johnson Escalating the war, support for Vietnam was anything but bipartisan as it had been before. In 67, Congress and eventually most of the United States was divided into two groups, the conservative hawks uh, and the more liberal doves. So those two are vocab words. Uh, they'll be on your vocast. We're going to end it here for Section 2. Here are your questions that go along with your note-taking guide. Um, make sure you answer those. And uh, we will talk about Section 3 next time.